So yeah, this is one of the three pillars of the anti-nuclear case. When you ever say we need more nuclear, they say what about the waste? That's the the main pillar. There's no solution to the waste. Yep. This is this is their talking yes, point, right? There is. Yep. And you're and saying that it's solved. It. It's a solved He's problem. Okay. We've done it. We're done. Yep. He's okay. In fact, not only is it solved, it is easy. <laughs> I mean, it is it is the easiest thing to do is to dispose of nuclear waste. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective on important societal issues. Hello, welcome to another episode of The Rational View. I'm your host, Dr. Al Scott. In this episode, I want to dig into the science and politics associated with one of the major bugaboos of fear around nuclear energy, nuclear waste management. The public policy debate around the energy transition from fossil fuels to clean energy sources is one of the most polarized and critical to the future of our society. The science is clear. Climate change is happening. Anthropogenic fossil fuel burning is adding CO2 to the atmosphere and it's causing the energy balance of the earth to change. More heat is being trapped. Over time, this leads to melting of the polar ice caps and all sorts of bad things. Sudden changes can wipe out ecosystems. This is the problem. The speed of the transition is something that ecosystems, we just don't know if they can keep up. So we could have significant problems if we don't slow down this transition at least. Now, the International Panel on Climate Change is the world body at the UN, which has all of this climate climate experts and all the people that understand the science, and they review the state state of the science all the time, and they're continually putting out new reports. Uh, IPCC have published pathways to net zero for civilization to follow, and some of them are very optimistic, and some of them are very pessimistic. But the, all of these pathways include significant admixture of nuclear power backbone to help the clean transition, to, to backstop the clean transition. And there's also a lot of other things like hydro energy, uh, variable renewable sources like solar and wind that can add power uh, intermittently. And yet the public policy debate hasn't caught up to the science. In public, nuclear is still a bit of a pariah. People are actually shutting down nuclear plants when the IPC pathways, IPCC pathways all say we need to increase it. The European Union Joint Research Council was asked by the European Union to go see, is nuclear really green and sustainable, like the scientists say? And they went back, they looked at the science, they said, yes, nuclear is green and sustainable. It does no more harm to the environment than these other sources. And yet the politicians are still worried that, you know, Germany is still planning to go ahead and shut down their nuclear. Belgium is planning to shut it down. And the environmentalists are going, well, wait a minute, this is going to increase carbon dioxide. Wait a minute, this is going to keep our coal and gas burning uh, facilities online for another couple decades more than they need to be. What's the basis of this controversy? Three pillars remain. One, when you ask someone about nuclear energy, they're going to say, what about Fukushima? What about Chernobyl? Are you crazy? Well, I've put out a podcast on this topic and feel free to go look it up at some point. Secondly, and second most important in these people's eyes, what about the waste? Nuclear uh, radioactive waste is a toxic legacy for future generations for millions of years. Therefore, nuclear is toxic and dirty. We shouldn't use it. That's what this podcast is going to address. So please listen up if you want to learn about the truth behind what about the waste. And the third pillar, of course, is nuclear is too expensive and too slow. And that's uh, easily addressable by looking at the median time to build nuclear and pushing through all of the red tape. And what we need to do to, to address all of these is to get rid of the misinformation, cut through the red tape, and get enough public support of the science, the IPCC pathways to get civilization to net zero. The scientists have already said, this is what you need to do to get to net zero. So in this episode, I'm going to pull together excerpts from several previous podcasts I've done, along with some commentary, uh, to tie the story together on what about the waste. As always, if you enjoy this content, 
please hit like on your podcast app. Feel free to share it with your friends. Uh, love to hear from you on our Facebook discussion group at The Rational View. And also come visit my website, www.therationalview.ca. I'll be taking a, a bit of a break after this podcast over Christmas and New Year's, and hopefully I'll start back up on January 8th. I hope you all have a great holiday and stay safe and healthy. So, a little bit of a background on nuclear waste. What is it? Where does it come from? So, nuclear reactors, Generation 2 and Generation 3 are the ones that are operating now, burn uranium-235, that's an isotope of uranium, to create power. This is only about 0.7% of all the natural uranium in the world is uranium-235, which is uh, the basis of our fission, our current fission reactors. And in certain reactors, they enrich this U-235 up to about 4% of the total uh, material, and that allows them to burn more uh get more energy per unit fuel mass out of it. The remaining 96% or or 99.3% in the case of Candu reactors is unused. The uranium just sits there and becomes radioactive. And the radioactive byproducts of fission, breaking down these uh, atoms of uranium, are contained in ceramic pellets that are then laid out into metal rods, metal fuel into these fuel bundles, and they remain highly radioactive once they're taken out of the reactor for hundreds of years. In general, radioactivity decays exponentially over time. So you have a certain amount of radiation and you have a half-life in days or years, over which time half of the radiation goes away. Now, because it decays exponentially with time, it's much more active at first and more dangerous uh, and then later on, it becomes less dangerous, exponentially less dangerous. You can also measure the potential impacts of this waste stream on human health. And this is a field called radiotoxicity. It includes looking at both the radioactive activity of the, of the, of the material, as well as its biological residence time in various tissues, which has been measured through scientific studies on animals. Now, radiotoxicity of spent fuel, there are papers on this, it starts out about a thousand times more toxic than natural uranium when it exits the reactor. And this decays by about an order of magnitude after a thousand years. So it's going down slowly. And then after about 130,000 years, which is a significant period of time, it returns to that of natural uranium ore. So it's no more radioactive or radiotoxic than normal uranium ore that's in the ground already. So each fission product nucleide, each, each atom that's formed through the fission process, has its own characteristic radioactive decay time until you get down to a stable nucleus at the end of the process. Dangerous radioisotopes have short half-lives and decay away relatively quickly. You're probably aware of radioactive iodine. That's why people who live near reactors have iodine tablets in place. They eat these tablets if there's a release so that the iodine doesn't bind to their thyroid gland and create cancer. Radioactive iodine has a half-life of eight days. So after about a month, it's really not a factor after there's been a release of radiation. Or in uh, nuclear uh, spent fuel rods, once you take it out of the reactor, the radioactive iodine component dies away after about a month. Other uh, worrisome, uh, highly toxic uh, components include cesium and strontium, radioactive cesium and strontium, which can bioaccumulate. And these have half-lives of about 30 years, still relatively short. So they're highly radioactive for, you know, 100 years, maybe even hundreds of years. And this is the really the, the bad stuff that you got to be careful of. This first hundred, few hundred years where, where you still have significant cesium and strontium uh, risk uh, for biological accumulation. Most of the other products are less worrisome. They either have much longer half-lives or they don't biologically accumulate. So they just are, are flushed out of the body if they're ingested, for example. So the only risk to population from 
nuclear waste products or spent fuel is through ingestion or inhalation. People aren't going, you can't get enough people to hug the spent fuel to be da damaged by the ambient uh, radiation from it. You can go up and, hu and hug a, uh, a dry cask, a dry storage cask and not be damaged at all. So how do we inhale or ingest these? Well, one is you can inhale it if, if it catches fire. That's never happened uh, from stored fuel. Or you can ingest it. For example, if it's buried in a deep geological repository and water gets in, it could get into the water table and then you could ingest some of the leached away radioactive compound, compounds. So the whole process to managing radioactive waste is making sure it doesn't uh, hurt people or the environment. And if we can assure that sig significant quantities don't get into the water table in the first thousand years after it's taken out of the reactor, then the population, the potential population health impacts really are mitigated. Beyond that, you know, it continues to decay away to nothing, but it's, it's less and less a problem. That's the good part, you know, no other hazardous waste stream becomes less dangerous over time. The fear response of the public, I think, is mainly due to uh, mental images of the byproducts of nuclear weapons manufacturing. During the Cold War, uh, this material, uh, which is used to uh, create highly enriched uranium and plutonium for, for bombs, effectively, uh, is a liquid slurry, and uh, it was disposed of by the military with very little public oversight uh, during the Cold War. Uh, Ideas about nuclear waste being an unsolved problem, I think, stem mainly from this heritage of military uh, weapons programs and mismanagement of waste. Um, they really didn't care so much about what they did with it. And that's led to a lot of problems downstream that society has to deal with. And unfortunately, this has been co-opted by anti-nuclear power groups uh, and foist upon civilian nuclear reactor programs. And that's basically a problem of misinformation. So here's geochemist Dr. James Conca, affiliate scientist at Los Alamos National Laboratory and a science contributor to Forbes on energy and nuclear issues, talking on the issue of radioactive defense waste. The old, you know, sludgy, uh, gross peanut butter-like texture defense waste, you know, bomb waste. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's that's you, always you need to solidify it because they 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 yeah. confuse that with reactor waste, and people have this right, idea right. of oozing barrels of reactor waste from The Simpsons. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's it's funny, but it's completely wrong. But the defense waste, um, again, more politics. We were ready to to grout it because it likes to be in grout. Chemically, it loves to be in grout, and we have grout formulations where it would completely unleachable, you know, high strength, perfect. Then because France vitrifies their sludgy waste from reprocessing, suddenly the people here, especially the regulatory people, got it in their heads, oh, we want to vitrify. Now, vit unlike France, this waste is the wrong chemistry for vitrifying. It doesn't like to be in glass. It hates to be in glass. So now you set yourself up to fail. <laughs> so so here's this VIT plant that was supposed to be online and working, and it's it's 40 years buying schedule, and it's 10 times over budget because it's the wrong thing to do. Um, but you can't get the state regulatory agency to buy off on grout because they love glass hmm. for no particular reason except France does it. Okay, so this is the kind of stuff that's, that's going on. Uh, I, and, I always uh, imagine that this is – done on purpose to, to hamstring nuclear industry. Some of it is, some of it is, um, some of it is just bureaucratic incompetence. Mm. Um, and, and again, the system is not set up for science to make any decision. It's yeah. It's just no. not set up for that. So what do we know of the time scales of packaging of nuclear waste in nuclear waste repositories? Well, Roman cement was used in Hadrian's Wall, and it survived exposure to the elements for almost 2,000 years, still holding those stones together. 
It's very similar to Portland spent, which is planned to be used to encase uh, spent nuclear fuel bundles. Archaeological finds have also shown that copper corrodes in water at the rate of about 0.15 microns per year. So a one centimeter uh, unbroken copper liner could last for 70,000 years before any risk of uh, water getting into the copper liner would happen. Similar uh, studies have been done on different materials. So we know roughly how long it takes for um, encasement materials to break. And these are time scales which we can manage, which get the stuff to very close to raw uranium ore, which is in the ground already everywhere, and we're bathing in the radioactive byproducts of it every time we go in the ocean. Anti-nuclear activists want you to believe that radioactive waste is a forever problem. But you have to think about this. Once the encasement barriers of the nu spent nuclear fuel are penetrated by water, you're still left with a, a ceramic pellet encasing the metal byproducts. And ceramic, like your coffee mug, doesn't leach into water. It doesn't break down. You could run water over your coffee mug a long time before any significant fraction of that is actually going to dissolve away and get transported to people's wells to contaminate their water. Anti-nuclear activists need you to believe that nuclear is unique in having a deadly toxic hazardous waste stream. They need this to be a black and white issue. But this is a false dichotomy. Yes, nuclear has hazardous products that remain dangerous for tens of thousands of years. And these numbers in isolation seem scary. But in reality, every power source entails mining of materials with associated refining manufacturing and processing waste streams. Even solar and wind, the so-called um, green uh, VRE sources of energy, require mining and processing and manufacturing. Toxic metals like mercury are added to the food chain from hydroelectric reservoirs, for example. Mercury remains toxic forever. It doesn't get better like nuclear waste. Solar cell processing and wind turbine switchgear use sulfur hexafluoride, which is a horrible greenhouse gas and toxic. Solar cells are permanently hazardous if they're fractured due to lead and cadmium toxic metals leaking out of them. Turbines have rare earth magnets. Batteries have lithium. There's no manufacturing process that human, humanity has defined that is free from waste. And none of the power sources have our hazardous waste free. As stewards of our national environment and ecosystems, we have to compare risks, materials use, mining footprints, and waste mitigation methods. We can't just say nuclear is dirty. We shouldn't use it. That's a cop out. Solar panels could be recycled but then they'll no longer be cheap. The Joint Research Committee has determined there's no significant difference in operation as usual between all these different power sources, nuclear included. My previous podcast on Fukushima went over that in detail, and the best science suggests that even rare mount meltdowns of nuclear reactors don't have a significant population health impact. Nobody died from the radiation of Fukushima. On a global basis, the amount of radiation added to our environment from nuclear accidents is dwarfed by the natural radiation background that we've evolved to thrive in, that we swim in every day. Fraction of a fraction of 1% is caused by man-made nuclear uh, contamination. What do we need to do to deal with this waste? Well, mercury and other toxic metals are routinely stored in underground geological repositories with no fanfare, no protests, no shrill calls from Greenpeace to shut down all of industry. Is there a double standard in play? I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Konka to get his advice. If you reduce any radiation to, to background, that would be good enough, right? I mean, background. No, that's not good enough. You have to be 100 times below background to be accepted. Now, that's insane. 
<laughs> that's just that's just insane. And so that's why you can't do anything because even waste disposals, you know, you can't, you know, you, you have to make sure that in the in the year 10,000, a hundred times less dose is getting out of your repository than is in the background. Uh, well, that's absurd. All power sources, including nuclear, could use recycling to mitigate their waste streams. Generation 4 breeder reactors, like the Russian BN-800, can burn up the remaining 96% of uranium that's currently being left in spent fuel bundles, leaving only short half-life byproducts that are dangerous over a few hundred years. Many nuclear supporters want to avoid deep geological repositories and burying the waste because it's a valuable resource and gets past the arguments about limited uranium uh, being a problem. Gen 4 reactors, which exist, which work, will give us thousands of years of power with the current existing spent fuel inventory. What's the responsible approach? What should we be doing? Here's Sheila Whitehawk, a nuclear operator at Bruce Power in Ontario, Canada. Sheila is co-founder of Willing to Listen, a grassroots group interested in pursuing the facts and benefits associated with potentially hosting a deep geological repository in their community. As a nuclear professional, you probably hear it a lot as well. What do you, how do you feel as a nuclear professional about the what about the waste argument? Is that an overblown fear? Like, why is this top billing? No, nuclear waste hasn't ever hurt anyone, has it? No. Um, yeah, it's never hurt. Civilian nuclear waste has never hurt anyone. Um, the, the what about the waste? I feel like it's very much the anti-nuclear activists clinging to something that is difficult to understand. Um, it's a very technical concept. Um, and a reasonable person might not know a whole lot about it. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's really easy to make the claim that nuclear waste is this big, bad, awful thing. Um, I, I do believe it's overblown. Nuclear waste, especially in Canada, has been stored safely and successfully for decades. We've never had an issue. Um, like I said, it's definitely anti-nuclear activists just trying to have something to argue against. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I first chatted with you, I was... Uh, saying that I was opposed to a deep geological repository because I'd rather recycle the partially used fuel and power society for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. uh, but you disagreed. Why do you support the DGR as a nuclear professional? Um, yeah, I wouldn't say that I disagree with the recycling aspect, but I do disagree with the notion that we don't need a DGR. Okay. Um, and for two reasons, because Right now, the waste is safe where it is, but it's very heavily reliant on on oversight and human intervention to keep it that way. Mm -hmm. um, I was speaking to someone and they had said it takes about 100 people employed to keep the fuel safe where it is by monitoring. And eventually there'll be upgrades to casks and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel very strongly that we need to come up with a solution that does not require human intervention before we actually need it. Um, if we're ever in a situation where, you know, the government or the employees can't look after the fuel, we're not going to be able to implement anything. It's probably going to be a situation like another world war where we won't have time <laughs> because, you know, a DGR takes time. I see. Um, and I also, the fuel is retrievable up until the point when they seal the DGR, they can get it back out, um, which is at the discretion of the community and the regulator. So, as long as the community feels there's a benefit to keeping it open or feels there's the p potential to reprocess the fuel, we can bring it back up and do so. Okay. So if you do eventually get a breeder reactor facility going that where you could reuse the 95% the of the fuel that wasn't burnt the first time through, uh, then you can go back and get it as long as it hasn't been sealed off yeah. uh, due to some other problem. Yeah. And my understanding is the placement rooms get sealed off first, but all of the access tunnels are still there until they actually seal the whole facility. So we're looking at at least 100, 150 years before they look at doing that. Now let's go back to Dr. Konka to get a deep dive into the science of DGRs. Um, there are seven criteria we use to, to determine whether a place is good. Okay, one is a simple geology. You, know, you need to know 
the geology. Mm -hmm. If it's so complex that you can't understand it, then this is not a good place to put it. <laughs> a simple hydrogeology, so how the water is moving through the subsurface, it, it should not be so complicated that you can't figure it out, okay, easily. Right. Okay, so it has to be a simple, it has to be a tectonically interpretable area. Okay. Now that's important. Yeah, you need to know where the faults are. You need to know where the falls are. You need to know where it sits in the plate, you know, intraplate or a plate boundary or whatever. It, you need to know that because that's really the most important aspect of, of, of placement is, is, is the tectonic uh, situation. Mm. Um, then you need to choose a rock that is that doesn't need a lot of engineering. I mean, the whole point of choosing a rock is that, I mean, I like the pyramids. Pyramids are great, love them, but we don't build things that last a million years, okay? So the earth does, however. The earth makes things that last millions or billions of years. So you pick a rock that is suitable, that has been formed naturally by the earth and that has all the properties you want. It's impermeable or relatively impermeable. It's the right redox. It's the right chemistry, all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you put it. Okay. So you shouldn't pick a rock that you have to engineer now, you know, huge amounts in order to make it work. So in 1957, the first nuclear power plant opened it at, at shipping port, right? So, and we had been making bombs for almost 10 years or about 10 years. Yep. So the Amer the um, Atomic Energy Commission, which is the predecessor to DOE and, and NRC, um, approached the National Academy of Science and said, listen, we're building up this weird stuff called nuclear waste. We need to do something with it eventually. What do you recommend? And they recommended WIP. Basically, that was it. I mean, they didn't call it WIP or anything, but they, sure. they said, ah, the Permian salt. salt. Permian salt, absolutely brilliant. It probably took them a half hour around a lunch table to figure that out because every geologist knows massive salt, not bedded salt, not salt diapirs, you know, or, you know, thing, you know salt domes, or anything, but bedded massive salt, okay? And we have a lot of that. <laughs> we have 100,000 miles of it. The best one is the Salado Formation in Southeast New Mexico, West Texas, in what's called the Delaware Subbasin where it's, per it's absolutely ideal. I mean, you couldn't find a better rock, a better place. And we don't have much nuclear waste to start with. I mean, all the nuclear waste in the world ever produced in history would fit in that one repository. You don't need, you know, two, three, four, or five repositories. I mean, we, you only need one. Okay. Now, each country maybe wants one. Maybe France should have its own. You know, Russia should have, so we have its own. the Finns have one. There are countries... Yeah, and the Finns have one, and the Swedes, and but they don't really have that much waste. And so the idea that you're going to spend billions of dollars um, building a repository for a few for a few reactors is, is insane. I mean, that's that's insane. So there is a a, a group in Europe called the Arias um, group that is got 14 countries together who have only a few reactors, and they're. They said, we need one place for all of us. We don't need 14 repositories for, for a few reactor waste. That makes sense. Um, so, yeah, so that, that makes sense. So there should only be a couple in the world, a few. Um, but, in fact, uh, I'm of the mind that we, you know, the United States should open up a salt repository and take everyone's waste. It's only one repository worth. I mean, all the nuclear waste in the world would fit in one soccer field. So why in the world uh, would you not do that? Okay, so, I guess people would be so worried kind of, about the cost of, of transporting it and the risk of, of sending it across the ocean. No risk. No risk. We, we've been doing that, by the way, a lot. People don't know that. We, we ship nuclear waste around the world all the time, <laughs> from, from England to Japan to France to Israel to all sorts of places. We, we ship this stuff um, and never have had a problem. And never have had a problem shipping it on land. In this next excerpt, Dr. Konka reviews the political situation in the United States surrounding the proposed Yucca Mountain DGR, which was recently uh, stopped, and the existing waste isolation pilot plant. You specialize in geologic disposal of, of nuclear waste, and as you say, you worked at the WIP right. facility. Right. <clears throat> and I worked on Yucca Mountain for 25 years. So I, I'm one of the original authors of the license application to wow. uh, NRC. Very proud of it. It's a lousy rock. <laughs> <laughs> Yucca Mountain is just a, it's just a lousy rock. And, uh, you know, but we've, we learned a lot from that program. 
Uh, and although most people, you probably heard most people say, oh, we wasted $12 billion. No, we didn't. Okay. 10 billion of that 12 billion, we learned for everything. It doesn't matter where you put it. So things like transportation, mm -hmm. corrosion, you know, cask development, uh, computer modeling, very, very important uh, of subsurface flow. So you can actually model how well the repository works over time. All of that doesn't matter where you put the repository. That was all very useful stuff, and we needed to learn that. We only wasted about $2 billion, which sounds like a lot, but over 30 years, I mean, that's really not very much. So, okay. uh, so that's kind of, you know, where it is. Now, WIP was, of course, much cheaper. Uh, because it's the right rock, so it didn't require all these engineered barriers that Yucca Mountain required be, to engineer around the fact that you picked the wrong rock. Um, and, it, you know, Yucca Mountain was totally political anyway. It was chosen for political reasons, oh, okay. not, not for scientific reasons. So it was a poor choice scientifically. It was a political... Oh, yeah. It was second to the worst one. Hmm. <laughs> you, you, you're pretty hard-pressed to pick a worse place. WIP was chosen... Uh, well, the salt. See, the whip is in what's called the Salado Formation. It's a beautifully massive, you know, 2,000 foot thick, 10,000 square mile uh, formation that is ideal for this. Absolutely ideal. There's no rock that is better. Now, there's other salts because salt is, is massive and at depth, at like a half mile depth, it creeps closed. Okay. It has a self healing property that cannot sustain an opening or a poor space, or a fracture, or anything. So very quickly, 10 years, 15 years, it crushes down. It's, you know, nature's big trash compactor. It's kind of funny. But it cannot sustain an opening, and okay. that's why it's perfect. That's why you can still find 250 million-year-old seawater stuck in it. Mm. Okay, This is where you want to put something, where it is so isolated that you just are given 200 million years of performance. You don't have to work for it. <laughs> you have simply given it. At Yucca Mountain, we had to work for 10,000 years. I mean, it was, is you know, okay, we need bentonite. Oh, no, bentonite's not going to work. Okay, we need, you know, titanium drip shields and all this nonsense because it's the wrong rock and the wrong chemistry. I see. So you're not too fussed that they've decided not to continue with Yucca Mountain at this point. You're, you, you agree oh, with I that was, decision? Oh, I was overjoyed. I, absolutely overjoyed. Interesting. They stopped. Okay. It's stupid. It's just a stupid place. And because... Because you have to engineer so much to fix it, um, the cost increased by a factor of 10. Yes. It was supposed to cost 30, 30 billion, okay? Then it was up to 90. Then it was up to 200. Now it's up to 300 or 400. And it, you know, last count, it could be 600 billion dollars because you picked the wrong rock. Um, so that's absurd, okay? Um, WIP is the right rock. Don't have to do anything to it. It's giving you everything it, you need right there. And that's why WIP is so cheap and has performed so well. So we've heard about DGRs in the U.S. and Europe. Dr. Ben Hurd of Adelaide, South Australia, is recognized as a leading voice for the use of nuclear technologies to address our most pressing global challenges. Here he discusses radioactive waste and storage in Australia. Something we have made progress on in Australia is to um, site our low uh, and intermediate level nuclear waste repository because we do have a nuclear industry in Australia. We have a very good research reactor in, in Sydney that makes medical isotopes, makes dope silicon, um, does a lot of neutron beam research, um, and we have a lot of legacy waste arisings from um, scientific research earlier, and we have no... Um, completed waste disposal pathway for radioactive waste. So we've been trying for decades and decades to site a, a waste disposal facility. And in 2014, Barry Brook and I wrote uh, an article um, in the conversation, which was picked up really, really strongly, where we said you know, the, the uh, clickbait headline was that nuclear waste is safe to store in our suburbs, not just the bush. And the point we went on to make is we can't begin from a paradigm of our nuclear waste disposal facility will naturally be located in remote outback Australia because why wouldn't you? Um, we were saying if we understand the hazards of this to be not all that bad, and we do, then it sends completely the wrong message to insist on sending to the, to the remotest parts of Australia. That's actually screaming out at people that this is incredibly dangerous and incredibly undesirable stuff. If we know how to control the hazard, and we do, we know how to characterise it, we know how to engineer for it, then it should be able to be sited in any industrially zoned location in any capital city. And let's start the process from there. Where the process ends is a different matter, but let's start it 
being very open about the sighting of that. Now, fortunately, what happened was um, the government was thinking the same way and I was invited to join the sighting panel for our low and intermediate level waste repository and they ran a voluntary sighting process. So we, issued, we put our advertisements in newspapers all over the country and we invited any private land holder with a suitable um, tract of land to offer it confidentially to the process for preliminary assessment. No obligations um, and uh, confidentially just so that they could be involved in the process without needing to get too involved or too exposed. And if they wanted to proceed, um, we would then have a long list of sites. The response was tremendous. Um, we ended up with, I remember the panel was ha having a bit of a poll and we were thinking, oh, how many nominations do you think we'll get? Oh, eight, maybe 10. Mm -hmm. Double digits was feeling pretty positive. We got 28. So wow. there were 28 strong nominations from all over the country. It went then went you know through to a short list. It went through a long consultation process of three different sites, all of which had been volunteered from the landowners and then the community did get involved, the local government did get involved and it became a local issue and they had the time to deal with it on a local basis. They had ballots to express um, their opinions on that uh, and we got a really strong response from a community in South Australia called Kimber that voted 62% in favour for hosting the facility. That's great. <laughs> yes, it is. It is. And the part of it was, you know, they were not under an obligation here. They were being presented with an opportunity from which they could genuinely withdraw at any time if they were ready. There was a little bit of upfront um, uh, money brought to the community as a thank you, acknowledging that this was this is work we're putting you through. Um, things were, were not tied. You know, they weren't being blackmailed or, or held to ransom for it. So it's surprising what we do when we can run a process where we free people up from fe not feeling that they are being imposed upon. Um, then they take the time to really take the information in and they pay very close attention. And that was um, that was successful. So I'm, I'm very pleased about that. Um, we're still grinding out some of the last bits of politics of that, but I'm, but I'm optimistic that that will, will go ahead. Now we come back to Sheila Whiteuck, who discusses the political DGR development process in Canada. Maybe for the listeners, can you outline what the what the situation is in Canada with the deep geological repositories and what the pathway is to to get to a, having a deep geological repository? Uh, sure, yeah. The Nuclear Waste Management Organization um, was given the mandate to, um, what's the right word? permanently store our fuel, our spent fuel, or to make a plan to store the spent fuel. And they did consultation with Canadians and a deep geological repository was overwhelmingly what people seem to have wanted. Um, so the NWMO started a process to look for a willing host community. It's always been their mandate that they will not force a DGR on a community that does not want it, um, which I think is a good starting point. Mm -hmm. Um, they started with 22, I think, communities that had stepped up and said, we'd be willing to look into this. And it has slowly dwindled down to two. Um, so South Bruce here in Bruce County and then um, Ignace up in northern Ontario are the last two remaining in the process. So where both sites are undergoing borehole drilling to see what um, the rock looks like, which is a huge deal for the DGR, the kind of rock that it goes into. It's one of the safety barriers. And uh, we're also waiting to determine if the communities are willing or not <laughs> to host it, which is another big question. Okay, so at this point, we don't know whether the science uh, or the, the, the geology of these sites will support a DGR. Right. Uh, we're just in the very early stages of this. What's, what's the timeline for, for this to go ahead if, if we find a community is interested? So they are wanting to determine a willing community or pick a host community by 2023 is kind of the timeline that we've been, been seeing a lot. Um, and it looks like about 10 years after that um, for licensing and construction. Mm -hmm. And it looks, I can't remember if operations would start in 2033 or if operations would start in 2030 or 2043. For a final word, let's return to Dr. Konka. So yeah, this is one of the three pillars of the anti-nuclear case. When you ever say we need more nuclear, they say what about the waste? That's the the main pillar. There's no solution to the waste. Yep. This is this is their talking yes, point, right? There is. Yep. And you're and saying is. that it's solved. You know it. It's a solved He's problem. Okay. We've done it. 
We're done. Yep. Piece of cake. In fact, not only is it solved, it is easy. <laughs> I mean, it, is, it is the easiest thing to do is to dispose of nuclear waste. The safest, easiest thing. There Thank you for listening. I hope this episode has helped to open your eyes a bit to the issues surrounding the what about the waste argument uh, commonly used against nuclear power. Don't fall victim to double standards. Nuclear is not unique amongst power sources in having a hazardous waste stream. It's not perfectly safe. Nothing is perfectly safe. Nor is it particularly more dangerous. Renewable energy also requires mining with completely analogous environmental issues to nuclear energy. Nuclear waste has the advantage that it gets less dangerous with time. So as barriers degrade, so does the hazard. Recycling is a potential mitigation for both nuclear and renewable waste, but it is not currently economically feasible for either. 100% variable renewable energy systems, at present, have significant risks in achieving deep decarbonization. And this has been recognized by the scientists at the IPCC. From my research, they don't offer significant benefits over nuclear in terms of the ecological impacts. And in fact, they have significant drawbacks in terms of land use and in terms of cost of the system that's required to back them up and support them. Currently, there is no such system in existence. So the real problem is not VRE, is not nuclear. The real problem is getting rid of burning fossil fuels which distribute their waste directly to the atmosphere that kills people. Let's stick with the science, follow the IPCC pathways, and choose nuclear. If you'd like to follow up with more in-depth discussions, please come find us on Facebook at The Rational View and join our discussion group. If you like what you're hearing, please consider visiting my Patreon page at patron.podbean.com slash the rational view. Thanks for listening.